KPSF believes that increased awareness and understanding of risk factors associated with perioperative visual loss, or POVL, is an important and current patient safety topic. Peer review literature and data from the American Society of Anesthesiologists POVL registry are evolving in a manner that suggests a patient profile at risk for POVL and steps to take in the surgical and anesthetic management that might decrease the incidence of this devastating complication. With this background, APSF sponsored a one-day multidisciplinary conference the goal of the conference was to assure that current anesthesia and surgical management reflected evolving information and understanding of best practices for patients at risk for POVL. In this regard, there seems to be increasing acceptance that the informed consent process for anesthesia and surgery should include the risk of perioperative visual loss in selected patients. The full text of the conference report and the best practices recommendations can be found in the winter 2013 issue of the APSF newsletter that is available on the APSF website. The keynote speaker for the conference was Anthony D. Lehner, an anesthesiologist who experienced post-operative visual loss caused by ischemic optic neuropathy following his own elective prone spine surgery. The occasion of my injury was a fifth back operation, a redo three-level lumbar fusion. Prior to the surgery, uh, the surgeon mentioned absolutely nothing about the possibility of visual loss. Uh, the anesthesiologist, who was my partner of many, many years, uh, asked me over coffee if I'd thought about the possibility of visual loss. And I had, but I felt there really was no other option. My operation took seven hours. It was about a 250cc blood loss, and I was described as awake in the recovery room, although I have no memory of any of that. The surgery was finished at 7 p.m. It was 11 p.m. when I left the PACU. My first awareness was at 6.30 the next morning, and it was noon before I was awake enough to realize that the visual field defect in the upper part of my right eye was not due to lacrimal lube ointment. It was a true visual field defect involving the upper 70% of the right eye only. Would I feel the same way about the decision to have the operation if I was now blind? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I may well feel differently. Clearly, I'm the outlier in terms, of, in terms of informed consent. Going into this, I knew far more about the risks than any patient probably before or since. But had I known nothing about the visual risk, I think that would have been a problem. You know, if, if I had not known that this was a possibility, I would have been really angry and probably had a lot of difficulty adapting to the thing. Um, people just need to know that this is a possibility, whether or not that's a pleasant thing to divulge to them. Patient consent and the risk of perioperative visual loss was discussed by Dr. David M. Corda. Dr. Corda and his colleagues were the authors of a report that surveyed patients' opinions regarding the best person, method, and timing for disclosure of the risk of perioperative visual loss to patients undergoing high-risk prone spine surgery. So the question is, how, uh, when facing more rare comp possible complications such as visual loss, what do I do? D does the patient want to know about that or does the patient not want to know about that? So our conclusion was at least 80% of patients prefer full disclosure of the risk of perioperative visual loss by the surgeon during a face-to-face -face discussion before the day of surgery. Dr. Karen L. Posner addressed the topic of closed malpractice claims and what they tell us about perioperative visual loss. So if we look at the over 7,000 surgical claims in the database, we see that eye injury is, represents about 5% of those claims. And um, ischemic optic neuropathy is about 0.8% of all claims in the database. And in terms of um, the role of informed consent in litigation, if there's no documentation and there was no informed consent, then it, it is uh, damning during the legal process. Um, normally, we know that you just, and as we've heard, informed consent describes the most common complications, perhaps serious complications. Um, what happens in the legal arena if a case goes to trial is um, 
it becomes the issue of whether a specific risks for this specific patient were discussed and documented. So um, while informed consent really is the basis of a lot of malpractice claims because of this um, desire for um, wanting to know, for an explanation, when you look at the claims, you know, it's usually the injury that's the major issue in the claim. Um, but when we look at ischemic optic neuropathy claims compared to the other surgical claims, we do see that informed consent was an issue in 10% compared to only 1% of other claims. Dr. Nancy J. Newman provided a neuro-ophthalmologist perspective. From the informed consent point of view, although I am not a stakeholder because I don't get informed consent, our feeling would be to include perioperative vision loss in these high-risk patients for consent. Dr. Robert A. Kaplan discussed the importance of shared decision-making in the overall care of patients at risk for developing perioperative visual loss caused by ischemic optic neuropathy. When we got to the issue about what to do about consenting patients for blindness, we asked, we want to be able to solve the following problem. We're done with surgery and a patient's got postoperative blindness and now they come to me only I had known about blindness, I wouldn't have had the procedure. So that's the problem that we set out to solve in our approach. We realized there were four concepts or principles, and these are the ones we use. First, we decided that we had to explicitly describe postoperative visual loss to the patient. It could not be subsumed in some other term or concept. It couldn't be subsumed under stroke or range of risks or something catastrophic. We decided that we had to explicitly describe it. Secondly, we described as a team who was going to step forward and bear the primary responsibility. And as, after discussing it as a team, our surgeons decided they wanted to have that primary responsibility. We also decided that it was important to check for understanding. Because the only way we were going to be able to say to ourselves, we don't have a patient who's going to turn around and say, I didn't understand that, is we had to check for the adequacy of that discussion. And so the anesthesia team decided their role would be on the day of surgery to check with the patient to see if there was understanding that blindness was a risk of this procedure. And finally, we all decided that if the anesthesiologist performed the check and the patient didn't have an understanding, we'd just stop. And we'd reconvene the patient, the surgeon, and whatever relevant family there was, and we'd go over that process, and we wouldn't begin again with that patient until we were sure the understanding was present. An overwhelming theme of the conference presentations, panel discussions, and attendee questionnaire responses was the importance of including the risk of POVL caused by ION in the consent process. The value of the informed consent process is dependent on those responsible for the perioperative care to be cognizant of the evolving information and strategies designed to reduce the risk of POVL caused by ischemic optic neuropathy. It is recognized that POVL is a rare event and might not be considered for inclusion in an informed consent process. However, the rare occurrence of POVL caused by ION is negated by the extreme value that patients place on vision, as demonstrated by patients' willingness to accept the risks of stroke, even death, to save some vestige of vision. The consensus of the attendees at the APSF-sponsored POVL conference and recommended best practices for patients considered to be at risk for perioperative visual loss from ischemic optic neuropathy can be summarized as follows. During the informed consent process, anesthesia professionals and surgeons should include the remote risk of visual impairment ranging from partial vision loss to complete blindness in both eyes. Discussion may include the concept that this complication is difficult to study because of its low incidence. If the risk of POVL from ION is not part of a combined anesthetic and surgical informed consent process, or part of a separate surgical informed consent process, it should be part of the anesthetic informed consent process. APSF believes it is preferable for the surgeon to provide the informed consent process before the day of surgery, with the anesthesiologist confirming the patient's understanding of the risk of blindness prior to induction of anesthesia. 
Complimentary copies of this DVD and a companion DVD including simulated informed consent scenarios under different conditions may be requested on the APSF website, www.apsf.org.